and welcome to The Art of Being Human. On the last segment, I started kind of a little mini-series on personality and what it is, and I explained that personality is a total sum of you, whoever you are. It includes all your physical characteristics, all your emotional characteristics. It includes every single thing about you, and that includes your attitudes, what you think about politics, who you would vote for, what color your eyes are, what kind of a personality do you have, are you gregarious, are you quiet. It includes every single thing. And I also explained that we make a mistake when we say that somebody has a good personality or somebody doesn't have a personality because we all have a personality. Whatever the sum of you is, that's what your personality is as well. Now, I also wanted to today go into self-concept because a big part of your personality is what you think about yourself and what you think other people think about you. So if you were to ask me the question, or if I were to ask you the question, we, we'll reverse it here, you know, what is self-concept? Most people would define it as it's how you feel about yourself. You can have a positive self-concept in, in which you feel good about yourself. You can have a negative self-concept in which you don't feel good about yourself or somewhere in between, and most of us are going to be in between. Hopefully, most of us will feel good about ourselves, but recognize that we do have certain weaknesses, and so therefore we're not perfect. And so we, we understand that there are some things that we lack, or we have problems with some things, but basically on the positive side. But you know, self-concept is really a little more complicated than that. Self-concept, if I'm to include what I believe, it is. It's, it is how you feel about yourself. That part of it is true. But that's based upon how you feel other people feel about you. So let's look at that for a minute. If, if I were to say your self-concept is based upon how you feel other people feel about you, your self-concept is usually a reflection of who you think other people think you are. If other people feel that you're gregarious and you're happy and all of that, then you feel you are too. You kind of reflect. You become kind of a mirror image of what you think other people feel about you, how you think other people feel about you, and that's important. You know, some people say, oh, you're a very nice person. So then I think of myself as being a very nice person. Now, there are other elements that enter into it, too. But if I have most of my friends saying the same thing about me, then I'm going to assume that that is true. The things that, that are said about me, if most people are saying them, yes, you are a musician, yes, you are this, yes, you are that, then I'm going to adopt that as my reality. Because the thing about what we believe about ourselves is that we believe what we think other people believe about us. If we perceive a certain thing, then our beliefs are based upon what we perceive. If we perceive the world as a friendly, good place, then our part of our philosophy of life is that I like to live the world as a good place. Yes, it has its problems, but basically it's been a good place for me. If, however, we have been abused and we don't think it's a good place, then we think negatively toward us, ourselves because we feel everybody is against us. Well, I'm not very good. People are against me. We believe what our perceptions tell us. If our perceptions tell us we're bright, we believe we're bright. If our perceptions tell us that we're not very bright, then we feel that we're not very bright. And so it gets to be a more complicated issue than, oh, I like myself, I think I'm good. Or I don't like myself, I think I'm not good. Or I have problems, so I must not be good. It's measured in terms of what you feel other people think about you. Because if they perceive you in a certain way and they are honest enough to tell you that, then you will start perceiving in the same way as they are perceiving. See, we tend to think that we make independent judgments. We really don't make independent judgments. Our judgments are based upon what we feel other people think. 
you know, in the world of politics. How many people like a certain candidate for president or any other elective office because they've heard so many people say, well, he's good, he's intelligent, he's, he's good in foreign affairs, he understands the world and its condition, he can help us with this, that, and other. And when we talk about that and when people tell us that over and over and over again, we start thinking, you know, oh, they're probably right. Yeah, maybe he is as good as we think he is. And so therefore, you tend to adopt that position. Why do advertisers repeat their advertisements so many times? There is a certain car commercial, I'm not gonna mention the name of the company, but that car commercial drives me crazy because it's every few seconds, sometimes on a five minute period, I may hear that same commercial or see that same commercial at least four or five times, if not more than that. Sometimes it repeats itself, so I hear the same thing two or three times in succession without a break. Now, what's the purpose of doing it that many times? Well, it must cost the company quite a bit to air it that much, but it's gonna make you think. You hear it over and over and over and over again, and you're going to assume that, okay, that's the truth. This car company is the best. They do have the best sales. They do have the best service. And why would you get that idea? Because it's been ingrained in your mind through constant repetition. There is some truth to the fact that when you hear something repeated over, 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 over again, you tend to start thinking about it as truth. Well, I've got one up on them. The mute button on my remote is what I use. When I hear the st opening strains of that ad again, after I don't know how many times of listening to it, press the button and mute it out. I've got too much stuff to do. I don't want to be listening to the same thing all the time. But that's what they do. Try to engineer and make the brain feel a certain way. And if they, if, for example, if uh, somebody's uh, advertising a certain headache remedy, you don't happen to have a headache, but in the sense, the advertisement, somebody's gonna be pounding on a table, or you're gonna have a repetitive sound that if you live, if you live through it, you're gonna hear the same thing over and over again, and it might even give you a headache. What do they want? They want you to get the headache, and then buy their product to relieve the headache. So it's manipulation. I'm not a person that likes advertisements because I don't like the manipulation. I'd rather have somebody say, this is our product, this is what it can do. This is what it can't do. We hope it'll help you. If you have suggestions, let us know. Please try it and, and just be honest about it. Not every product helps everything. And if and I get tired of politicians who are constantly saying, I'm the best, I have the answer, I can take care of this problem, the others don't know squat. What they I know is what we need. And so if you vote for me, I'll take care of the economy. I'll get the economy moving again. The jobs will come back. This will happen. That will happen. As if one person by themselves can engineer the whole world so that they can be the savior of it because of all the good things they're going to do. And expect people to believe that. Now, that bothers me because I, I just don't think that's the case. You know, no one person has got all the answers. You know, that's, that's just the case. You know, we are limited human beings, but that's what happens. And when you're talking about self-concept, and I want to bring this back to self-concept, you are going to start believing what other people are telling you about yourself if they're honest. Now, they may not be honest, and they may praise you for all kinds of things that you don't deserve the praise for, but if you think they're being honest, and you think that's what they're really thinking, you adopt that, and you listen to it enough, and then you start to think, that's really who I am, isn't it? I never thought of myself that way before, but that's really who I am. So self-concept is not just what you think about that yourself. It is that, indeed. But in addition to that, where did you get your opinion? You got your opinion by everybody telling you certain things, and then your self-concept starts to reflect the fact that you think of yourself the way that you think 
other people think of you, so I'll repeat that because it gets to be a little bit complicated. You think of yourself the same as you think other people think about you. And here again, that's more complicated than we can believe, but that's just the way it is. So uh, that's uh, what I basically want to say about self-concept. It is, in terms of mental health, it is best to have a positive self-concept, but to also have some realism that uh, you can't do everything, no person can. And even if you think you can do everything, it doesn't mean you should do everything. You have to pace yourself. Yes, I can be an engineer, or I can be a doctor, or I can be a pharmacist, or I can be a nurse, but should I try for all of it? No. You have to pace yourself and pick what's best for you and follow that. It doesn't mean you can't learn other things. It doesn't mean you can't do other things, but if you want a multi-career, then you need to focus on what is most important to you and focus on that. Other things can be added later. So here are some rules of thumb about how the brain develops, and that's important because whoever you are, it's going to be partly nature and partly nurture. I think a lot of what is in our personalities are genetic. I think we're born to be a certain way. And I think we're born with a lot of characteristics. Some people don't believe that, and I understand where they're coming from, but is, is a nature-nurture conflict. Are you basically who you are because of your brain, because of your hormones, because of what your body does to you, because of your neurotransmitters, because of the, your physique and things about your physique uh, and what you've inherited? Well, that's the way I tend to feel. But that's moderated by the things that happen to you because when things happen to you and you get into a certain environment and you're raised in a certain environment, the various things that happen to you can alter the way you feel about yourself. And so therefore, the nurture is the environmental part, how you grew up, how people treated you when you grew up, and uh, that's nurture. Nature is what you were born with, and the two interplay off each other. It becomes, it becomes a little conflicted because of the fact that the brain has, it has a tendency to have plasticity. By that, I mean that it does have a plasticity about it in which it adjusts to and works with the environmental cues that it's given. In other words, you may learn and have difficulty learning certain things, but somehow if it's presented to you in a certain way, you can learn other things that you didn't think you were capable of. The brain can actually change. If you're taking medications, for example, if you're taking psychiatric medications, that can change the nature of the way the brain works. And that effect can last for years and years and years, even if you're not taking the medication for years and years and years. One of the values of therapy, and I'm going to talk in terms of talk therapy, this is when you go into a, a counselor's office and you have problems and difficulties, and so the counselor talks to you. And you can change your attitude and you can change your behavior because of what the counselor says. And it can have a very, very positive effect on your life. You can be healed in many cases of a lot of personal problems and you can work through them and resolve them with the help of a skilled counselor. And it may seem like the counselor is not doing much. He's sitting there making comments or talking to you or maybe asking questions. And it may seem that that's not very much, but it can change if it's done well. I do mean if it's done well. It can change the way that you think, and that can have a very positive influence on your life, and that positive influence will stay with you even when the therapy is done. You know, you don't see a counselor forever. You may see them for quite a while. You may see them for years. On the other hand, maybe you only see them for a few months or a few weeks. But they can change the way that you think about yourself, and they can change the way that you approach your life, and they can change the way that you handle problems. 
and that can be a very positive experience. You can come out of, of therapy just without the medication. You can come out of therapy feeling really good, very positive, able to handle your life in a way that you weren't able to handle it before. And it can be a positive experience that extends, that actually can change the way that the brain perceives. But that, when you talk to people, you do that all the time, don't you? I talk to a person that's negative, and I say, well, look at it this way. There's another way of perceiving this. And then I work with a person and work with a person, and they say, oh, yeah, I never thought of that before, but you're right. And that changes their perception without any use of medication. Therapy can be really, really good in terms of helping people, even without medication. But supposing you need medication because just talk therapy by itself is not going to do it enough for you, and you need the help of medication. And some psychiatrists basically give medications, and they don't see people for much therapy. The medications can change the way your brain works. It can change and alter the brain chemistry. And as a result of that, you can start feeling much better. And then when you stop taking the medication, supposing you need it for years, you take it for years, but supposing you only need it for a few months or maybe a year or two or maybe just a few weeks, that positive influence that the medication has had on you can stay with you and that can be with you for a long time, for years to come. The positive influences of therapy with or without medication can have a positive influence and can change the way you view yourself and it can change the way you view the world. It can change the way that you view other people and it can be such a positive experience that now you understand things you didn't understand before. Now you have a grip on things that you didn't have before and that can last and last and last. It can last for months, it can last for years, and it can change the way that you look at things for basically the rest of your life. And that's a good thing. So when we're talking about self-concept and personality issues, we're really talking about some pretty complicated things. Um, people feel the same way for different reasons. People feel differently for the same reasons, you know. It gets to be complicated. But this is the kind of thing that I want to spend a few weeks on. Not a lot, because I have another major project that I want to get into coming up. So this is kind of a breather between projects, a breather between uh, the chronic illnesses, which we basically have finished, and what's to come next, the development of the human being. And this section that I'm doing in the middle here kind of prepares us for the new section coming up. So just remember, you are a very, very complicated human being. That's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. We weren't made to be simple, we were made to be complete. And as, as this progresses, you can probably understand a little bit more about yourself so that you can be complete. So I'm not going, I'm going to close it here. I don't have much time left. And, and, and I hope you will join me for the next segment in which I continue on this vein. And I'll tell you some things about development and what happens to your brain as you change. And I think it'll be pretty interesting. So we'll close it here. Please join me next time.